All right, so this is this is going to be episode four of the Diamond Strong podcast. Um, we're bringing on a dear, dear friend of mine, a man of faith, family, fighting, and a small business owner, actually. Right. Um, so with all we do, this is uh, Jim the Beast Allers. Hey, what's up? What's up? So uh, I've known you since 2010, <laughs> but... For uh, those people that don't know you or don't know about you, you know, tell them a little bit. All right. So, man, I am, man, so much. So I have my own, my own gym, um, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu MMA type gym. Um, I've been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu MMA since 2005. Um, I'm a black belt and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, just um, someone who just loves to be around the sport. And so I decided, let me make that my life. You know, I have my my family there with me um, at all times, you know, so it kind of makes it makes the owning a business and and being at work fun when uh, I get to be there with them. Um, Man, I fought in the UFC, um, got my degree from UCF. Um, in elementary education, go and, next. Um, man, I mean, I guess it, it can go on and on, man. So, but, um, yeah. Nice. So, um, let's tell people how you kind of got into jujitsu slash MMA. How'd you get into it? So I wrestled in high school, you know, um, I kind of fell into that one because just a friend of mine that was in when one of my math classes, he uh, was like, man, I just like kind of challenged me to like a friendly fight, you know? And I was like, man, in my mind, I can beat this guy. You know, he didn't seem like someone who will be able to beat me up. They say, you know, most men believe that they can, they think that they can fight better than what they really can, you know? And I was, I think I was one of those men at the time or teenagers and, you know, we like went behind the portables and he just kept slamming me on the ground. And I was like, man, I need to, I need to learn this, you know? So I joined wrestling and then, you know, I wrestled for a few, few years. And after wrestling, I wanted to find something that was similar to that. Uh, I found Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I just remember walking into a gym called Gracie Baja and didn't even try a class. I was like, okay, I saw what they were doing. I said, it looked a little bit like wrestling and I was like, okay, let me give this a try and um signed up without without trying to class you know and fighting wasn't really the goal at first it was just uh do brazilian jiu-jitsu for fun it was a hobby i did it maybe two days a week while i worked at walmart and any day i had off you know i tried to spend as much time as i could in the gym and just through time i guess and just training you know i figured i was at the gym all the time and i started training some striking and i was offered a an mma fight to fight at you know, the college that I was going to in in the auditorium there. So I thought that was a pretty cool idea. So I did that. They offered me a whole $500 and, you know, big boy money. Yeah. You know, being 21 years old and in college, I was like, heck yeah, you know, and um, I won that fight pretty fast and, you know, still wasn't an idea of let me like make this into a a living. It was just more of like, Hey, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. And I just kind of took it one fight at a time. And eventually I was, was like, man, I'm, I have a pretty good record here. Let me, let me keep going with this. So when I graduated college, I was always, I, again, I graduated with my degree in education. I said, Hey, I can always go back and be a teacher. So let's just see where this takes me. And I just, I just kept pursuing it. Nice. Very cool. So, you know, I had a front row seat to a lot of those uh, yeah, man. MMA fights, but let's talk specifically about combat night and how you know you basically got to see the world i mean there's a lot of different ways people try and see the world and or you know try and travel and the way you did it was kind of unique yeah man definitely i i always said if i don't if i didn't get anything else out of fighting i hope i at least got to travel the world on someone else's dime and i thought that was really cool i think by like my seventh fight i started fighting overseas and um, my first fight was in was in the Middle East, I think, um, 
my first fight overseas was in bah- Bahrain, the kingdom of yeah. Bahrain. And, you know, that was just a big culture shock. You know, they didn't want us to go outside without shorts on, without pants on. And it felt like, I mean, can't really explain it, man. I was going through, through, through markets that seemed like they were through the times of Jesus and stuff like that. So that was pretty awesome. And, you know, they just kept offering. I told them, man, I'm, I'm, as long as I'm healthy, I'll fight. So um, I ended up signing a five fight deal with um, Cage Warriors. And they brought me to Bahrain, Jordan, Ireland, which, you know, you came in into that fight with me. That was an awesome New Year's Eve um, title defense. Uh, I fought in Scotland, Wales, um, and Abu Dhabi and Russia. I mean, I've got to fight in. So some pretty cool places. I always try to stay about like a week or so after so I can kind of explore the area. But, um, man, I can't be... Um, blessed enough to say that you know i got to do that and didn't have to really spend too much of my money doing it so like at what point did like in your head throughout fighting did you think like this is my business now like at what point did like that kind of mind shift shift and it was just like you know because for a while we were just having fun fucking around kind of going out there fighting and scrapping and then (laughs) there's a shift. Um, like in, in I, I think, you know, I, at some point, I think when, when I started teaching and I just kind of saw the, you know, and I wouldn't even say fighting, like fighting was always something that I always kind of seemed as extra, you know, like I always had a job and then I, I kind of taught, I've been teaching jujitsu since I was a purple belt. And, you know, I think once I started teaching, Jiu-jitsu. Which for everyone who doesn't know, that's about 2009. So yeah, yeah it's about 2000, long time. 2009. Yeah, I think once I started teaching jujitsu, I um, kind of saw that that uh, gratification that I got from you know bringing happiness to people. And I mean, you you teach jujitsu, so you know like how sometimes when you know you notice there's one more person left on the mat, you know, and you're cleaning up, you know, you're, you become a therapist, you're the coach, you're, you know, you're so many, you have so many different hats. And, you know, I think at that time I was like, man, you know, I can do so much good here for a lot of people. You know, I think this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life, you know, in some way or form, I want to be a part of martial arts, you know, and just make that, make that into my living somehow. Nice. Um, and then I guess we kind of have to talk about it, like your whole beef with Connor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that dude's not, blown up, but not what a, they don't know is it without without if, without, if, without uh, bringing that up. Um, if uh, if he had fought you, I would still put a large <laughs> sum of money that at that time he was going to take an L. Like at no, that I time, mean, he wasn't yeah, ready yet. I still believe, you know, like mm-hmm. I said, I think my my um, bread and butter was my jujitsu throughout my fight game. And I, and I used it well. And, you know, I think that was definitely his biggest weakness was his wrestling and his jujitsu. I think his only two losses at the time were jujitsu guys who I, who I feel I can, uh, could have easily handled during that time. And it just, you know, the, the stars in the line and it just um, wasn't really meant to be man, you know, and he kind of took off and, you know, more power to him, you know, for a while I was like, damn, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuck to me like, man, you know, what if, but, um, but, you know, over time, you know, I've realized everyone has their, their own, their own path. And, you know, my path wasn't, wasn't fighting him and, you know, everything happens, everything happens for a reason. You know, I, the more that I come to it, you know, that I come to realize, like, I don't really like being in, in the eye of others and being in, like being a famous person, you know, I kind of like kind of stay into myself a little bit. And, um, you know, we'll see how we see how that how it's affected him in a lot of ways. You know, he has all the money in the world, but who knows, you know, who knows how he's um, handling it. <laughs> well, you're, you're definitely still Orlando famous for whatever. Hey, that's there you go. There you Just go. Orlando famous. That's in the 407, <laughs> you're famous. Uh, let's see. All right. So then after Cage Warriors, we have the Beach with Connor, which, by the way, Connor McGregor still has some of our friends blocked on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, Lou, man, people, pull, out to people Lou. still pull those up, man. People, 
it's funny i'll get like a notification or something saying that someone liked a tweet from 2011 <laughs> that, that connor wrote i'm like oh my wow. god these people go way back um but then you transitioned to the ufc i know you had that fight in abu dhabi that was a fucking barn burner i mean you guys went at it and you came out on top there you dropped a couple but then you also had that fight <laughs> on uh May 5th, I remember, because it was like the May the 4th with you and Cole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that that clip kind of went a little viral. It still comes up like every May the 4th. Like, yeah. You pulling uh, out a lightsaber during weigh-ins. Yeah, man. It was awesome. I mean, especially getting into the UFC during that time. I had just, you know, I've, I just got fired from the gym I was working at. You know, I'd never been fired from a job before or anything. And, you know, there was just a lot of animosity and... <laughs> You know, just anger, I would say. And, but like, again, everything works out for a reason. You know, um, we ended up starting our own gym. You know, you, you ended up getting fired just for cornering me in a, in a match. You know, you got, you ended up getting fired in while you were in Ireland. And, uh, you know, no we, just, <laughs> you know, we decided to do our own thing. And, you know, this is before I was in the UFC. So, you know, we were training. We basically just had like what I call like, you know, we kind of had a club. It was just me, you, and a few other guys, and we were training hard, you know, and, you know, God, you know, saw that. And, you know, we got, I got blessed to get the call to be in the UFC during that time. And you're right, man, that first fight was crazy. I remember I got knocked out <laughs> two times, I think, before the fight. I got, um, I remember getting um, rocked really bad in the boxing gym and, um, and um, I was sparring with, which you should never do this. I was sparring with Seth Petruzzelli, who's a heavyweight. And he ended up knocking me out, quick, quick flash knockout before that fight. So I went into that fight, you know, heads already all rocked. I really don't remember too much of it uh, because I remember like being rocked from the beginning and just kind of going off instinct. But um, it was an awesome fight. I ended up winning by split decision and just kind of ran into a bunch of bad luck at in, in the UFC, I would say. Um, you know, I ended up poking, poking one of my guys in the eye, getting a no contest and then losing my, I ended up losing my final match with a um, split decision, but you know, we got five of the night. So that kind of helped the pain a little bit, <laughs> but um, yeah. it still sucks to, to lose, you know? And then um, I don't know, after that, it was hard, you know, after getting cut from the UFC, I think I, um, man, this kind of went into depression and, you know, a bunch of stuff. You work so hard to get to a place and then it's just gone in the blink of an eye, especially, you know, after putting on, you know, a, a great performance, you know, even though I didn't get the nod in, in one judge's eye, but um, it was like, oh man, what do, what do I do next? What do I, you know, what am I, you know, like I'm, you, think you're just, you start thinking of yourself as just a fighter and you're like, what else, what else can I do? <laughs> and um, so that was a hard, hard transition. And then, um, just, just, man, I, a lot happened during that time. And, you know, I started, man, I found, started going back to church and just, I think, um, just life had his way of just bringing happiness back to me and opening up my gym. And I would say since then, you know, I've been some of the happiest years of my life, I would say. Nice. Yeah. Like, I think your whole like turn to faith has really like centered you, you know? like and brought you down and helped you know you build this new version of yourself um but then like you kind of took a crazy transition too and got into bare knuckle man yeah which <laughs> i knew i was still nervous about and still scared yeah. about I, I, would say, <laughs> I would say man every friend of mine was like oh, of course man come on man you're crazy you know um, but, you know, for me, it's always been that way. You know, when I, when I said, you know, I want to, to fight, you know, oh man, no, nobody ever makes it, you know, man, you know, what are the odds of me making it to the UFC and this and that, you know, I've, I've had a lot of that from, from people who I called my, my best friends and stuff at the time. And, you know, I had to shut out that negativity and I would say, I just, you know, kind of did what made me happy. I am. You know, bare knuckle was, you know, it just came at a time where I had just started my gym and 
I remember David Feldman, actually the matchmaker called me first and he's like, Hey, you know, would you be interested in bare knuckle? I'm like, you know, I've never even seen it before. You know, I don't, I didn't know too much about it. And what he offered me, I was like, no way, you know, I would never, I'm like my last fight I made this much, you know, I'm not, there's no way I would fight for that. And then, um, David Feldman, the, the, um, president, he ended up calling me back and he was like, Hey, I'm sorry. That was a disgrace to even offer you that. I don't know why he offered you that without talking to me. And then he gave me a number, which was more than I was making the UFC after my, like after my last fight in the UFC for my, for my first bare knuckle fight. And so I was like, man, you know, I had just started the gym, you know, it doesn't hurt to, to take this fight. I'm like, I've been in many, 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 uh, bare knuckle fist fights throughout my, <laughs> throughout my life already for free, you know, so what's it going to hurt to do a, a sanctioned one, you know? And again, I still never even been to a bare knuckle fight. I didn't know what it was really going to be, but I kind of convinced myself that, Hey, I'm probably going to get messed up. I'm probably going to get a lot of cuts and bruises and I'm probably going to be hurt. So I kind of convinced myself, Hey, I'm going to do this one and done and then we'll see what happens. And um, as you know, we kind of went in there and it was like a 40 second knockout. I took no injuries and, um, man, I just, it was a beautiful, beautiful knockout. And again, I, I thought it was, I thought I was done, you know, I was like, okay, whatever. It was fun. And they ended up calling me two weeks later to come in as a replacement for a main event against um, Leonard Garcia, who I remember watching so much coming up as a fighter. And I, I you know, I was like, man, this is crazy. How much though, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, what our audience doesn't know is that after every one of your bare knuckle fights, you're telling us like, "Yeah, I'm done, man. That's it. I'm good." Of course, man. and we're like, "Yeah, great. <laughs> no, yeah, no, don't do this shit again. No, stop. Yeah, you're yeah. right." And then we all get a group text or in the chat, basically, "Hey, I'm fighting yeah. again." <laughs> it, and it, it was it's hard, you know. I I think if I saw and you see many fighters now as um as they're coming into retirement fighters who've been doing it for a long time, that it's, it's so hard to just say you're done because that love for, for competition, you know, really um, is just there all the time, especially when, when they're just kind of throwing this cash at you, you know? So, you know, again, I convinced myself that I was going to be bloodied up and cut up and all this stuff. And it didn't happen the first time. So I was like, let me do it again, you know? And, Ended up doing the same thing again, winning really fast, and just kind of did it for about four fights. Just kind of the same thing. Just kept kept winning and just kind of um, making a name for myself in this sport, where to me it was just supposed to be something fun. You know, I wasn't looking to make a new career or anything like that. You know, I was really focusing on my on my gym, and I I think I, I mean I was only training for bare knuckle maybe two times a week and as for boxing, but I was doing jujitsu every day still until I finally, you know, until I finally lost. And then once I lost, I kind of just was like, all right, it was fun. You know, I got kind of cut up and everything. Like I said, I was expecting. Yeah, but, all right. So you're saying, Oh, I lost. You lost in the championship fight at 155. You were depending on the poll ranked anywhere between like the number one 55 er to the third ranked 55 er for bare knuckle in the world. And then you lost. Right, right. But so it wasn't like, oh, you fought once or twice. No, no, no. Oh, this yeah. dude went to war with some legends. Leonard Garcia is a scrapping legend. If you yeah. know anything about MMA or anything about fighting in general, you know who Leonard Garcia is. He's one of these tough as nails Mexican dudes that like he goes into zombie mode and is unkillable. Unless he I mean, was, I was fought you, I was scared going into that fight, hundred percent. Like I'm like, man, what am I doing? I've seen. This I was scared game. for you. I remember I'm in Kansas City at the time, watching my phone. Like, oh my God. yeah, I remember. I, I'm like, I've seen so many people try to knock. He's never been knocked out before, before that fight, you know. And so I was the first person ever to do that, which was uh pretty cool. It's kind of cool to say that I've done that, you know. I and and. You know, so I, like I said, I just kept kept going, man, and ended up losing. He's a, you know, the guy that I lost to is still, he's a 155 and 165 pound undefeated pound for pound champ right now still. So he's still killing it, you know, and more power to him, man. But um, yeah, I think after that, you know, I it was just like, man, I think, I think now I can finally 
be um, be done with it. But I, I hate to speak in absolutes. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a Sith. You know, so I. <laughs> I, I hate to ever say never because, you know, there's still things that I would like to do and I would love to to fight in Japan one day and um, fight pride rules just to say just to say that I did it, you know, and, and stomp on someone's head one day or something. Um, you know, just just that competitor and that fighter, in me, you know, wants to to just, you know, have a bunch of goals that I've set out in the beginning that I want to do, you know, and, you know, if they come up you know, then heck, I'll, I'll jump to the opportunities. That's the one thing I think, like, uh, there's a lot of stuff I respect about you. Like, the one thing that I've always respected about you, and I mean, sometimes it's ended up in some, and, and it, us up in some crazy ass situations. <laughs> but like, this guy's going to do whatever he thinks he wants. So like, if and I say that exactly how it means because sometimes it's what he thinks he wants what i think so whatever he thinks he wants he's gonna go after it yeah like and i mean it could be you know paddle boarding during the middle of a wedding it could be you know bare knuckle boxing like the range is is huge yeah man and i think a lot of that man honestly is is no is is man life is short you know when when our friend Milton passed away when he got killed, you know that that was a lot of uh, like kind of changed my thought of life a lot. It was just like man, it could be over really quick. Everything you know, so let me let me just live it live it to the fullest and and make make memories with my, not only myself but with other people. You know, so that when I'm gone, you know, people will be like, man, that guy was <laughs> that guy lived his life. You know. Uh, the one thing I do know is most of our friends, like in our friend group, like some of the best stories we have are because Jim decided to do something <laughs> or Jim decided to just like, Hey, let's go. And just kind of dragged us all along for a wild ride. Uh, I mean, some of them are crazy. I remember a couple with you dressed up like Willy Wonka and us going uh, on Man, Halloween. I mean, crazy things, you know, but, you know, I think, um, you know, especially as I as I get older, you know, I hope that through a lot of the the um, experiences that I've had, you know, I can tell my students, you know, like, man, I went that route. I don't know if I would go that route if I was you. You know, I don't know if I would do that. Just saying, this is from my experience. You know, I don't know if that's the best 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 route to go or this or that even with so many so many things not just with martial arts just with with life in general like i like i talked about earlier you know you become a therapist you become so many different hats when you when you're a coach and you know just your wisdom and experience that you can give to your students is so valuable right there so let's get into a little bit like um i know like now you're really deep into your faith and actually something I'm proud of that you, you know, come around to and have been to, I know you were always a Christian. Um, and we always talked about that, but, you know, kind of get into that and how you're, you know, becoming the leader of your family and honestly, your friend group. I would say that, um, you know, saying you're a Christian and actually like living that life is so different. You know, I would say that, all my life, I, I went to church and, you know, um, I was told, you know, I went to church and I, you know, I just kind of did the, did the, did the routine, you know, you go in, blah, 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 you, you do the whole thing, you leave, you go on Sundays, you know, and I was almost always forced, but I don't think I ever really, you know, I kind of, I knew there was a God and this and that, but definitely wasn't living, living that life I was doing. A lot of things, like you said, a lot of things that I that I thought that I, I needed or that I wanted to do. And you know, I always felt, you know, I guess, you know, even at the highest of high in the UFC and winning, I still felt like I was missing something sad. And um, and it's because I just wasn't living the life that that I should, you know, walking the light that um, that Jesus would walk in and just, you know, even if you don't believe, you know, and if you just try to follow you know, the life that Jesus lived, you're, man, he was such a good, such a good man, you know, like that's how everyone should live, good morals, do the right thing, help people out. 
And um, I think I was just in a very dark place at that time. I think I, I, you know, I wasn't going to church anymore. I think when I moved to Orlando, I kind of just stopped. I kind of stopped going as an as an adult for maybe maybe ten years or so. And you know, I think after I got cut from the UFC and you know just kind of fell into a bunch of depression and just I, I don't I don't even know why I ended up going to church. Maybe something happened and it just felt like the the preacher was talking directly to me and i'm sure a lot of people who have been saved or you know um kind of reignited their their um faith kind of can tell you the same thing you know like you go and maybe at that time that that sermon is is for you and i was just like man i'm looking around like is this crazy this is he really just like talking to me right now and i you know i and it was just about you know what type of man are you you know are you a man that that that, um promotes their family promotes their wife shows love you know um all of these things and i'm like man you know in my mind i felt like i i was you know but in reality i wasn't and you know right then and there i was like man i need to change this because i i always had this um not hate but this this dislike for this life that my father had with me going up and I'm like, man, you know, am I doing the same things, you know? And I was like, no, I, you know, I don't want my kids to ever grow up and be like, oh, this, this, this about dad. You know, I want them to think, man, dad was the greatest person ever. He, you know, he helped out, he helped people, he loved people. He, you know, he gave, you know, to, to the needy, he helped the needy. He, he taught us, you know, that, you know, this is what we should do. This is how we should treat people. Um, this is how he treated our mom, he treated our mom with love and respect. And, you know, that's what I want them to see. And through that, you know, it just helped me, um, I think, just become that better person, that better father. And just showing that love for for Jesus, really, and kind of just trying to bring other people to to that same to that same feeling has has just made me feel happier all the time, you know. And I think that's what it's about. I feel happy doing it. It makes me happy. It makes me um, know that, hey, they're going to feel that same love. So now, like, uh, that you have that perspective and, you know, you're, you know, you're raising a family and everything. I mean, truthfully, like, the world has kind of gone the opposite direction that you're going. <laughs> I mean, right. like, uh, you know, we have a whole bunch of different genders now that I'm not sure of and, <laughs> you know politics are you know kind of crazy right now but i guess like how do you navigate that as a father raising a young boy and a young girl so you kind of you have to play both sides yeah man i think it's it's hard in today's world you know my my son right now he's you know he has kids in his in his grade he's in third grade that that don't want to be called him or, or he or something. I don't, I don't really know the the pronouns on what they want to be called. So I'm like, man, that's, you know, that's a crazy that we're living that right now because I don't think personally like kids know these things, you know, it's something that's taught to them, you know, and I think just showing them, you know, like I said, showing them how, how I live and what a good father should be and what a good husband should be, what a good man should be, you know, giving them those values, having him actually, you know, they do and they copy what, what you do. You know, you notice that your kids start saying things, they're acting the same way that you do. Maybe they, they like do certain movements that you do and, you know, they're going to um, see what you do and want to, want to copy you, man. They want to be like you. So I try my best, like I said, through, you know, putting them in, in jujitsu or doing this and doing that, that will hopefully give them these good values, taking them to church, you know, showing them like, Hey, giving them the routine of, of good values <laughs> hopefully that they um, can understand and just talking to them, man. I would say throughout my, I, throughout my life growing up, I didn't have a relationship with my, with my parents, you know, they were, they were hardworking parents. They did what they had to do, you know, but I wouldn't be able to say that, man, when I was sad, I went and talked to my, to my parents. Or when I was um, feeling down, I went and talked to my parents, you know, um, I kind of kept it to myself. And so I tried to, as much as possible, you know, go, you know, give them one, all, both one-on-one time, 
you know, having a boy and having the girl, you know, not keeping them together all the time and giving him his own time so we can go out and just talk and, you know, I'll, you know, ask him how he's doing, how's school, you know, what, you know, what makes him like, I'll ask him like, Hey, are you sad about anything? Are, you, are your friends giving you a hard time? Is there anything that you want to accomplish? What are your goals? Um, same thing with, with my daughter, you know, and they're two different people completely. Um, so, I mean, it's hard because like you said, the world, the world is crazy right now, you know, and the only thing that we can do is just kind of guide them and, and direct them in the right direction, because especially as someone who's taught kids for a very long time, I've seen everything. I've seen parents who have been completely strict with their kids. Like, you know, my parents were very strict with me and I felt like I turned out kind of crazy doing whatever I wanted, you know? And then I've seen <laughs> parents who kind of let their kids do whatever they wanted. They turn out to be amazing kids and vice versa. Of course, like kids, parents who let their kids do whatever they want and they turned out shitty, shitty adults, you know? And, um, and vice versa. So really the only thing we can do as parents is, is just kind of guide them and show them what, what we feel are the right morals and kind of show them what a good leader and a good, um, person is, you know, and hopefully they can see us and value us as a good role model. And like, man, I want to be like my father. I want to be like my dad. Um, so that's, that's the thing. Hopefully that I'm, that I'm doing the right thing. And he kind of sees that. So what is, uh, now that we have the parenting advice out of the way, what is some advice that you would give to, let's say you have a young guy or girl wanting to get into MMA and you know, seeing the UFC and says, that's what I want to do. Like, what is your advice to those people? Don't do it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, man, I think um, if it's definitely something that, that you're passionate about, you know, then, then do, do it. You know, don't do it for the fame. Don't do it because you think you're going to make a lot of money. You know, don't do it for those reasons. It needs to be because you love it. Just like with anything, man. You know, if you don't have a love for it, you're going to hate it. You're going to you're going to quit. You're not going to want to continue when you have passion for something. You're going to continue doing it. it you're going to have setbacks. But because you love something, you're it, it's going to keep going. It's like anything, man, with with marriage or with anything. You know, if you love if you're in love, you're going to make it work. You know, you're going to work at it. You're going to work hard to continue. You know, uh, nothing's going to be easy. So you got to continue to push and work hard and discipline and consistency. And through that, you know, you'll be successful. And everyone's level of success or their range of what success is, is different, you know. But if you're going out there and you're, you're you know, you can say that you had great experiences and you had a good time and you enjoyed what you did, man, more power to you. To me, that's, that's success right there. Awesome. So really the only thing I have left is of all your friends that are named L, who's the best at jiu-jitsu? <laughs> all my friends who aren't named L. Man, L's a beast. Um, Wagner probably. Man, Wagner is, is <laughs> I, I consider him, more, I mean, he's definitely my friend, but he's like one of those coach friends, you know, that, that you're like, man, he's just amazing. But um, as far as this, like, friends who I would say, like, we came up together, man, it's hard. You guys are all – you guys are good in your own in your own ways, man. I would say even even Juan's good now, you know, in his, <laughs> in his own way, you know. Um, and that's beautiful to see, man. I, I can't tell you – I can't name too many people who can say that they've had, you know, such a big group of friends that have stuck to jujitsu and have, you know, made it all the way to black belt. You know, they say only 1% of people who you start with make it to black belt. I mean, when I met half of you guys, I was already a purple belt, you know? So it's, it's cool. It's cool to see how long, you know, and your you guys consistency. And what I tell people is like, man, what's so awesome about jujitsu is that, man, you can take breaks and you can, take time off, but, you know, come back and continue, you know, you can take 10 years off, you know, but, you know, come back and, you know, it's going to welcome you like you never left. I mean, it, it'll suck in the beginning for sure to try to get back in shape and everything, but um, the love, the love will always be there, I think. And man, who, who's the best? 
you guys should all fight it out one day. <laughs> Give me six more months. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man. I mean, that's kind of all I have. I appreciate so much your time. And, you know, I know you got a lot of stuff going on for you, you to cut out time on such short notice. I, I appreciate it, is, it a ton. This came from an open mat, man. I, every day, Boda. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the worst Brazilian. <laughs> uh, I can't wait for Melissa to start whooping you. Man, she's good, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. All it's right, man. Good. Well, I love you. Thanks for giving me your time, man. I appreciate it a ton. Um, Thank you, man. Take it easy. That's episode number four. Adios.